All right, open your Bibles to the letter to the Hebrews. We're at chapter 9. There are only 13, so we're moving along here through Hebrews. Our scholar for this book is Dr. Fred Craddock, who taught for many years at Candler School of Theology, Emory University, Atlanta, Georgia, one of our really great universities and one of our great seminaries. Still living, but retired now. Uh, I still see... uh, Advertisements in Christian Century and other magazines where he's speaking, lecturing, teaching, uh, but retired. Uh, wrote this commentary just shortly before he retired from Candler. Dr. Craddock says this is not really a letter in the sense that Paul's letters are letters from a person to specific other persons, be they in Philippi or Corinth or, or some other place. He sees this as a sermon. Mailed, if you would, taken some other place. He wants it to be read, this author, uh, in the various churches that have been established by that time, but not a letter, more a sermon. We know this person was very conversant in classical Greek, not just the street Greek, if you would, the koine Greek, because he uses sophisticated words. Um, You can tell that he's educated. He has a very keen understanding of the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures called Septuagint. He quotes always from the Septuagint when he's quoting Scripture uh, from that Greek rendering, not the Hebrew. Um, So we know a little bit about him. We don't know nearly as much as we would like. We don't know exactly to whom he's writing. So our mothers and fathers of the faith decided he's writing to all of us. He's writing to all of us. This is holy writ and ought to be a part of the canon, uh, that which we hold to be scripture, uh, a word from God, uh, written by real people, limited by their own. God, thank you for your book, for those who wrote it, those who have protected it, preserved it, those who now can translate it those who can now comment intelligently upon it. So we pray that this morning we will find things forever true about you, about us, about how we relate to you, who initiate relationship with us, how we may appropriately respond to your approach, how we may appropriately respond to each other. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Hebrews chapter 9. I marked we were at verse 15. That sound right? All right, we're going to read uh, through verse 22 to start. For this reason, he, and he's here, this pronoun is a direct allusion to Jesus Christ. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, because a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions under the first covenant. Where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established, for a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Hence, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been told to all the people by Moses in accordance with the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the scroll itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God has ordained for you. And in the same way he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins. I had a district superintendent, uh, my second one, way back years ago in Texas, uh, who loved this 22nd verse of ninth chapter of Hebrews. Uh, being a district superintendent, he didn't have to write a sermon over and over and over. Uh, I was trying to be sure that, that he knew who I was. So when he was preaching anywhere close around, I went to hear him when I could as a student and so on. And he used this text over and over and over. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But he took it a step farther and went, without the shedding of blood, there is no. And he had several points in the sermon. And what he meant was without sacrifice, without 
sacrifice, if you would, there's no real marriage. There's no good parenting. There's no so on. But this was his lead off. Without the shedding of blood, there is no, and he added the, the predicates uh, in any number of different directions there. Let's see what credit can help us with, and then, then I will share a little bit here as well. The writer, whose name we do not know, of course, now returns to the theme of covenant and to the language of Jeremiah 31. If you were here last Sunday, you recall that he's been relying heavily on the work of Jeremiah, and he does here again. And the basic text from Jeremiah's work is chapter 8, 9, and 10. So if you want to pick up on that, you can, you can take another look. We dealt with Jeremiah, of course, several years ago, uh, but those chapters 8, 9, and 10 are the ones this author is specifically referring to. In the plenitude of meanings explored in the discussion about Christ purifying and atoning offer of himself, yet one more is now to be unfolded by this author. The death of Christ as the inauguration of the new covenant. Remember, uh, let me just stop and, and remind you, even if you were here. Jeremiah writes in the throes of another exile. Okay, this one in Babylon. The first one, of course, being in Egypt. All right, so uh, there were a number of these great prophets who lived in the 8th century, the late 700s who anticipated uh, the destruction of perhaps all of the Israelites. Only the northerners got destroyed in 721 by the Assyrians. The southern tribes were spared that time. Uh, others of the great prophets wrote in those intervening years between the destruction of the northern tribes called Israel, you remember, uh, that had been led by really vile folks like Jezebel and Ahab. Well, those were destroyed in 721. And, and then other, so some wrote about that coming disaster. Others wrote in the interim, uh, saying the same fate could befall the South if they did not turn to God and, 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 and get right once more with God and with each other. Uh, then you have a few that actually endured into the next devastation, which was in 587. Remember, 587 and 586 took a couple of years to lay siege to the city of Jerusalem, uh, finally to breach the walls, uh, to strip the palace and the temple, the two most magnificent buildings in the old city of Jerusalem, strip both palace and temple of gold, silver, bronze, anything of value, and then set fire to both of them. Uh, the walls were tumbled down as much as the Babylonians could tumble one stone off the other, and then the gates to the city were burned so that Jerusalem was vulnerable to anybody and everybody who came riding down the road. And the best and brightest were forced marched away to Babylon. Uh, Babylon uh, stood where modern-day Iraq stands. So think Baghdad as ancient Babylon. Uh, Baghdad and Iraq would be uh, the the descendants of the ancient Babylonians who destroyed them. Jeremiah lives into that exile and writes out of it. Now, we had another great prophet who lived in that exile and wrote out of it, and we call that one Deutero-Isaiah. Remember? We had the first 39 chapters of Isaiah written by one anticipating the devastation with chapter 40. Remember, this tenor soloist, opens the Messiah singing from chapter 40 of Isaiah. Comfort, comfort ye my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. War's over. They've been devastated. They are now in captivity. So second Isaiah, that is Deutero or second, beginning with chapter 40, continuing we think to about 55, is a second writer. And Jeremiah wrote into that period as well. So Jeremiah knows the temple is gone. I mean, he saw it. It's burned to the ground. All of the valuable things inside are gone. The Ark of the Covenant, the beautiful box holding the tablets of the Ten Commandments, never seen since that time. And ancient Babylonia was itself plundered by the Persians. And uh, both uh, the, the archives of ancient Babylon and Persia were stripped by later great powers. I've told you that at the Pergamum Museum in Berlin, you can see uh, many of the ruins of ancient Babylon, including some of the walls. They had a, a beautiful blue uh, color. They had learned to bake onto stones 
and make the walls. You can imagine how it must have gleamed in that bright sunshine. Anyway, you can see uh, walls and sculptures and so on from ancient Babylon in the German museum in, in uh, what was East Berlin. Now, of course, it's a reunified city at the Pergamum Museum. Gail and I have been there twice and, and have seen those ruins. Uh, okay, Jeremiah lives in that time. He knows that the temple is gone. Their place of offering sacrifice gone. And uh, even fear that the Torah itself is gone. Certainly the, the venerated scrolls, those that uh, were in the holy places uh, on the temple, were gone, burned. Uh, the scrolls did survive. They were smuggled out and they did survive. But he's talking about then, okay, the old covenant had to do with blood sacrifice, Jeremiah believes. And so he speaks about a new covenant. A new covenant where the people will not be able to offer sacrifice in Babylon, but how they must not just roll over and die as the northern tribes did. The northern tribes just became assimilated into the Assyrian culture so that even today we speak appropriately of the ten lost tribes of Israel. The southerners were not going to do that. They were determined, and Jeremiah was one of their leaders, we must not just give in and go along and become Babylonians. We mustn't. But we don't have a place of sacrifice, so we need a new covenant. Jeremiah, let's be honest, is not anticipating a baby born at Bethlehem to Mary and Joseph. He is not. He is not thinking of Jesus. But this author is looking back through Jesus of Nazareth, and he sees in Jeremiah's writings this anticipation of a new covenant not based on blood. See? See? No more sacrifices. They don't have an altar. They don't have a temple. So we can still be people of faith without blood sacrifice. We may not even have Torah. There may not be enough here who can read Torah. So I will write Torah on their hearts, Jeremiah said. Okay? Even if they don't have it in rolled up scrolls, they will know what I expect of my people. So we just need to be honest with each other here that Jeremiah is not anticipating 600 years later the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. He's talking about much sooner than that. He believes that God will redeem his people. Remember redeem? To buy back. To buy them back from the Babylonians. To set them free. That God will pay a bigger price, if you would, and set the slaves free to go home. That happened 50 years after they were marched off. The Persians, modern day Iranians, overran what is modern-day Iraq today, and let the Jews go home. Many did not, but some did. And they got there, and the city looked just like it had 50 years before, except now it's overgrown with weeds and briars and, and vines. Still looks the same way it did. All right. So let's just remind ourselves. Jeremiah is writing into that kind of situation, and this author is picking up on the New Covenant and seeing it as being established almost 600 years later in Jesus of Nazareth, and sacrifice offered once and for all and no more ever again. That's what he's envisioning here. Okay. Everybody clear about that? All right. Let's go on then uh, with Craddock's explanation. So this one, Jesus, is the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted through better promises. His death provided an inheritance for those who are called to inherit salvation, wholeness, meaning, and even resurrection after death. Second, Christ's death sets us free from transgressions under the first covenant, meaning the Torah does in fact point out what things are right for us to do and things that are not right for us to do. So under that Torah, no one came out perfectly well. Everybody violated Torah at some time or other. Uh, Paul would say, you know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's the idea here. Okay, in verses 16 and 17 that we read, the writer proceeds to argue the necessity of Christ's death for the inauguration of the new covenant that Jeremiah anticipated. And the argument is based on the principle that a covenant takes effect only at death. In other words, we can make out a will and last testament, but it doesn't get put into effect until somebody dies. Uh, the, the one who's written or had written uh, this covenant. And so he's saying Jeremiah wrote it uh, almost 600 years before, but it doesn't take effect until the right one has died, and for him that right one is Jesus Christ. Okay. 
the question is this. Do verses 16 and 17 make sense if the key term keeps the sense of covenant? Well, yes, if one assumes the writer is arguing on the basis of ancient rites of covenant making in which the slaughter of an animal symbolically represented the parties who pledged with their lives keeping of the covenant. In support of his interpretation, one may recall the dividing of slaughtered animals on the occasion of God's covenant with Abraham. That's in Genesis 15. Let me remind you about that. Uh, God approaches Abraham and tells him to offer all these animals uh, sacrificially and to pile half the carcasses over here and half the carcasses over there and then to be patient and wait. And so this old man, remember he is a hundred years old, supposedly when God first showed up, this old man sits there with the hot sun beaten down on his head and flies eventually coming to the carcasses. But it's only after dark that he sees an unusual light coming. And this unusual light comes right between the carcasses to Abraham. And he believes this is the same one who spoke to him and Sarah in their tent years and years before and promised them a child. This is God Almighty who has said, offer sacrifice. And God comes between these piles of meat as a symbol. You see, in covenant making, we've all seen uh, you know, everybody from Huck Finn to Native Americans who slit their thumbs and stuck blood to blood. Remember when Huck and Tom saw old Potter uh, murdered, they pricked their thumbs and touched blood to blood and swore they wouldn't tell anybody. Okay, all of that's behind this. You have these two huge piles of animals, blood everywhere. So the pledge was, you see, may I become like these slaughtered animals if I do not remain true to the covenant. In this dramatic presentation of God, Abraham, can I count on you? You can certainly count on me. All right. So we're going back to that reference, Dr. Craddock believes, that this author has that story in mind as well in Genesis 15. So God accepted the blood of animals as a substitute for the blood of people. Uh, the Jews believed that they were never supposed to offer up each other, their children, and so on, as sacrifice. Jephthah made a terrible promise one time, uh, but, but basically Jews believed always God does not require our children or any of us to be sacrificed. Uh, animals will suffice. Uh, verses 18 through 21 provide the example of the shedding of blood as essential in the inauguration of a covenant. Uh, to the Sinai ceremonies, that which uh, Moses brought down from the mountain, goats are added for, from the Day of Atonement, then water, scarlet wool, hyssop from the ceremonies of the red heifer, whereby they were supposed to be forgiven. In spite of all the substances used at different times in Israel's history, the writer draws your and my attention to one element. This is the blood of the covenant that God has ordained for you. This blood of Jesus Christ, which does away with blood sacrifice forever. At this, at this point, the author feels justified in stating a general truth, and that is, under the law, the Torah, almost everything is purified with blood. The qualifier, almost, is an acknowledgement that in the Levitical system, that is, the old Levites, Descendants of Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, that family, that tribe, in the old Levitical system, there were some rituals of cleansing using substances other than blood. Second, without the shedding of blood, there is no putting away or removal of sins. And the Greek text does not have of sins, as the New Revised Standard Version adds them, because they think that's the sense of it. As this statement looks forward, it anticipates Christ's atoning work and his mediation of a new covenant under which I will remember their sins no more. So, without bloodshedding, there is no forgiveness. Both the understanding and the appreciation of the message of this 
sermon, Hebrews, requires placing oneself within that ancient cult in which the above-mentioned vocabulary and actions were integral to their rituals of cleansing, renewal, approaching God, forming of their community. The writer is presenting the benefits of Christ for believers in these same images, obviously with hope for the same effects. But these Gentiles to whom he's writing will sense that they've been cleansed, they've been renewed, they've been able to approach God, and they should now form a community uh, who believe in uh, and worship the one true God. Okay, let me give you... uh, Let's go on and read now these, these next verses, starting with 23 to the end of the chapter. Yeah. Thus it was necessary for the sketches of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves need better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself again and again as the high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood that is not his own. For then he, Jesus, I think Jesus here is, seems to be closest to high priest, but if you read it carefully, I think you'll find it's not. Uh, that's not the antecedent. Then he would have had to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. That is Jesus. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, but not to deal with sin that's been done, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Okay. Um, Let's see if Craddock can help us here. The occasion, once again, is the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. The officiant is the high priest, and the setting is the Holy of Holies. The reader is asked to think again in the categories Plato gave the Greeks of the real or true heavenly sanctuary and its earthly shadow or sketch. That is, the one Moses built, less than perfect. The rites described earlier purified the building, vessels, and people related to the tabernacle, which was but a copy of the heavenly one, but the heavenly sanctuary itself required a better sacrifice. Okay, let's stop here and and let me see if I can help you a little bit. In the New Testament, there's always this struggle uh, as to whether the new young church will be more Greek or Hebrew. In the lection for today, if you haven't been to church yet, uh, Paul is talking about with what body are the dead raised? What sort of body is this with which people are resurrected? And one of the scholars I read this week said, most Christians today in America think like Greeks. Paul was not a Greek. He was a Jew. And if you want to believe what Paul believed, you need to think like a Jew. One, there is no resuscitation of corpses. A body that's dead remains dead. But there is a resurrection body. And what Paul is trying to say is it's not just some wispy spirit that is not intelligible, not recognizable. The Jewish understanding is if the person is raised, it is a body recognizable in continuity with that one who died. He says, even though a seed doesn't look like what it later becomes, a seed of grain does not become an apple. A seed of a tomato does not become grain, becomes a tomato. The seed doesn't look like the finished product, Exactly, but in that seed, and this is what Natalie Sleeve picks up on in the Hymn of Promise. In every seed, there is a promise of an apple that waits to be. In every cocoon, a butterfly waiting to be free. But 
that little squishy worm doesn't look anything at all like the butterfly. Yet it is the same being, if you would. This this uh, earlier stage doesn't look at all like the final stage, but it is a continuity. So Paul is not thinking like Greeks. Most Christians, this scholar said, do think like Greeks. A spirit hooks itself to a body. When the body dies, the spirit flits away to God. That's a Greek idea. The Jewish idea is things really do die. And apart from God, there is no hope that anything else is going to happen. This body is going to waste away. In Jewish burials of Jesus' time, they were often buried in caves, often had stones rolled over. It gets really hot in Israel in the summertime. And like the people buried above ground in New Orleans because the water table is so high, if you let the body stay in one of those concrete raised above the ground burial places, all the liquids in the body, which most of us is liquid, water, it evaporates away. And they have long sticks with little boards on them and they can just push what remains back in the corner and bury somebody else. In the Jews of Jesus' time, they waited for the sun to beat against those rocks, create great heat inside, the body goes away, evaporates, disintegrates, and what few bones were left, they put in special boxes. Okay? Ossuaries. Ossuaries. Little bones. Little box with whatever remains there. Okay? So, Paul is saying, we don't believe these bones are resuscitated, but rather that which once inhabited this, these bones and this flesh is given a resurrection body, but it is individual and it is recognizable as having come from that one. That may seem like playing on words, but it was very important to Paul. We're not Greeks, we're Jews, he was. And the Jewish understanding, you've had one body, now you're going to be given a new body. One was of dust, one will be spiritual, but not just a wispy little thing that may attach itself to some other body some other time. Once born, once died, once raised uh, to God. Okay. Um, Let's go back to another thing here that Dr. Craddock had just said about the Greeks. Those of you who had to study classical philosophy, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, you recall that in the Greek mind, they talked about a three-storied universe. Everybody still believed the earth was flat, Jews and Greeks at that point. Earth was flat. So below the earth, the nether world, if you would, damp, dark. Above, light, heaven. The Greeks talked about only in that third level is there perfection. Everything on earth, a mere copy of the perfect. For example, chairs. I've used this before. A chair. A chair may have legs too long for some, too short for others. Too soft for some. Too firm for others. Too straight up for some. Too laid back for others. We keep making a better chair, the Greeks were saying, but we never have gotten it perfectly right. Every chair is a representation of that which is perfect, but a perfect chair would be found only up there in the realm of ideas. And this is one reason you see why Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain, you remember Matthew wrote Sermon on the Mount, Luke, Sermon on the Plain. And we can tell that they both have a common source. They have places in these two sermons where they have whole paragraphs that don't vary even one word in Greek. But Matthew's author is a Jew. There's a good chance that the person who wrote Luke and Acts, Gentile. So they're going along here 
with do what your heavenly Father has taught you to do. And Matthew says, be perfect the way God is. That's not a problem for Jews. They believe you can do Torah. You can do Torah. You can do everything God tells you not to do. I tell you to do, and you don't have to do anything God tells you not to. You can do this correctly. Do it the way God does. That'll be perfect. Luke is writing along saying, boy, these Greeks are not going to get this. And so they're going word for word for word until that little word, and Luke ends that passage by saying, therefore I say to you, be ye merciful. As your Father in heaven is merciful. He changes the word. Scholars are pretty sure Matthew's was written before Luke. And Luke is the one that changes the word. From perfect to merciful. Okay. What Dr. Craddock is saying here is that this is not a Jewish idea about a temple perfected up above us. The Jewish idea was, first of all, the temple, if you would, that set-apart tent was a tent when Moses and children of Israel were still moving from watering hole to watering hole for 40 years. It was a tent. It was only after that 40 years, the 200 years of judges, and the first few years of kingship before Solomon would get the temple built. And then they would have a really beautiful holy of holies. But this writer, you see, is thinking, I mean, he knows Jeremiah, he knows Genesis, he knows Torah, but he thinks like a, like a Greek. Okay? That's all Craddock's trying to say. When he talks about the heavenly one, Jesus didn't go in the one down here. We know he didn't die on the Temple Mount. He died on a little hill that looked like a skull called Calvary. And yet, in that temple, up on the top of the hill, the curtain was torn in two, the writers of the gospel say. Meaning, not only priest, not only high priest, but everyone can enter into and behold the face of God, if you would. All right? Let's go with chapter 10. Since the law, and here again, Torah is a better rendering, uh, when I say that, I don't mean I'm smarter than the people who translate it. They're being faithful to the Greek word. The Greek word is nomos, N-O-M-O-S, it would appear in English, nomos. And that did mean law in the Greek community. But the word Torah doesn't mean law, as I've told you over and over. It means the instructions or the teachings. So there wasn't a comparable word that got used in the Septuagint, nor got used in the 27 scrolls of the New Testament. So over and over and over they used nomos. And uh, one of the words we read, and if you read much serious Bible study, is antinomianism, which means the early Christians, some of them decided, well, if we don't have to do all of Torah, like eating kosher and circumcising all of our grown men, then we don't have to do any of it. We are anti-nomos. Okay? There is no law for us. That's what some believed, erroneously. There's no standard. We can do whatever we want to. We've been set free. So that word is properly translated law. But for these people who are writing about those first five scrolls, they're thinking Torah, instructions and teaching. So that's why I, I over and over use that word when I'm reading it with you. Since the Torah has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the true form, see here again, he's using Greek imageries. Uh, nothing on this plane where we live could ever be perfect, even Torah. And he's even saying about Jesus in a sense, he ascended to that level where perfection is. The perfect temple where God resides, where Jesus now has sat down, his work completed. But here again, Torah is on this plane and therefore never quite perfect to this author. Okay, since the Torah was only, has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the true form, which is only above, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually, continually offered year after year, make perfect, perfect, 
Those who approach. Greeks know there's nothing perfect in this life. Otherwise, would they not have ceased being offered since the worshippers cleansed once for all, if, that, if it could cleanse once for all, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there's a reminder of sin year after year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, See, God, I have come to do your will, O God. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to Torah. Then he added, see, I have come to do your will. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second. And it is by God's will that we have been sanctified, means set apart or made holy, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Okay. Um, let me just remind you, so you can remind all of those who haven't gotten it yet, the Jews quit offering sacrifice 1939 years ago. Okay. So the Jews haven't offered blood sacrifice in almost 2,000 years. Within about 40 years of the death and resurrection of Jesus, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. And the Jews reverted to how they had had to live under Babylonian captivity. No sacrifice. So no Jews anywhere in the world are offering or have offered blood sacrifice for almost 2,000 years. So they still have Rosh Hashanah, the new year, harvest time. And the ten days of introspection, of looking hard and long at oneself and at the whole community of faith, and then coming to temple or synagogue on Yom Kippur, where prayers are offered, hymns are sung, sermons given, and so on. And God is asked to move from the seat of judgment to the seat of mercy. No blood sacrifice. Okay? All right, let's get back to these ten verses. The reader of these verses will need to be careful, lest the high degree of repetition lull the mind into missing what is strikingly new in this 10th chapter. For example, verses 1 through 4 seem at first merely a summary of what was said in chapter 9, verse 1. However, a closer reading reveals a new perspective and a new accent. The new perspective has to do with the use of shadow substance schema associated again with Plato's philosophy and introduced into Hebrews in chapters 8, 9, and 10. This writer is now thinking like a Greek. That the benefits in Christ are to come does not mean that they are totally futuristic from the believer's perspective, but that from the perspective of Torah, they were to come. The new perspective is a move away from spatial categories below and above, and a return to temporal categories, old and new. The new accent is the impact of the high priestly ministry of Christ on all who believe in him. The writer is responding to the inwardness of the new covenant. The major inadequacy of the system of animal offerings was not only the inability to remove the conscience of sins, but also a reminder by the act of constant repetition of the very sin that could not be erased by the process of sacrifice. Conscience is an ancient word variously used in Hellenistic, that is Greek, circles, Jewish circles, and Christian circles to refer to the human capacity for self-knowing, self-accusing, and when liberated, self-affirming. It's the writer's term of choice for locating the place where the objective act of Christ's sacrifice meets the subjective self of the believer. Did that make it through to you? Let me stop and say it a little clearer if I can. Um, as scholars have tried to deal with how we differ from chimpanzees, uh, great upland gorillas, 
Uh, even Neanderthals, did you see the big article this week about uh, continuing research in Germany on Neanderthals, and they've been able to reproduce some DNA from uh, ancient uh, skeletal remains and so on of Neanderthals and say that uh, we are not much closer to Neanderthals than we are to the great upland gorillas. Uh, they were a part of the planet for, for thousands of years, but, but only a fraction over 99% what we are, as are some of these other uh, ape-like forms. But in trying to figure out how we differ, scholars used to say, well, we are the tool makers. Uh, that went away when Jane Goodall and others discovered that chimpanzees, in fact, know how to make tools. Uh, they learn to make straws and lick them and stick them into termite mounds and pull out the termites that stuck to them. Uh, they learned how to use sticks to flail away at fruit that was over their head and yet on limbs too weak to support their weight and so on. Uh, they've learned to crack some shellfish uh, on rocks and so on. So <clears throat> that went away. Well, we don't differ just that we've not learned how to make tools. And so what they did talk about now as the human brain developed, they talked about our being self-transcendent. The frontal lobe of the brain uh, gives us the ability to project ourselves outside ourselves and look back and be critical of self. And the simple little example they've said is that chimpanzees may love bananas, but as far as we can tell, there's no evidence they ever sit around and wonder why they like bananas better than they like rutabagas. Humans can do that. Why do we like bananas better than rutabagas, you know, or Brussels sprouts? Why? Um, this ability to project ourselves outside ourselves, though, Craddock is saying, also makes us be self-critical. Self-critical. And when he says, but through redemption, we can become self-affirming. Did you hear that part? What does that mean? It means, if you really believe the gospel, that God loved you, while you were yet a sinner, that Christ died to show God's love even while we were still sinners, that must make you somebody important to God. And if you're important to God, then there must be something good about you. He doesn't love you because you're good, but he loves you believing that within you is the capacity for good or something that's good. You can do good work. You can do good deeds. You can become a good person. And to believe that God Almighty would care about one, would know one's name, would want you to do well, you have the favor of the Almighty, the Bible says, the goodwill of God. God wants good to come to you. It's supposed to enheighten your own self affirmation. Okay. That's what Craddock is saying. That the ability to be critical of self makes us choose to be critical of self. And that it's a gift of God when God's grace says you're a person of worth. You're a person of value. You're a person capable of doing better. You can be a positive, constructive, meaningful presence in somebody else's life. Maybe a number of other people's lives. Okay? That's what he's talking about. Okay, so this ability to be, to project ourselves outside ourselves. Here's the other thing we learned, of course, about this ability to project ourselves out. When we can project ourselves into the future, we tend to be anxious. And so to combine that with Jesus' teachings, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. God knows you need food and God knows you need water and shelter and so on. Look at all the lilies of the field. They come up year after year. Look at the birds of the air, even little sparrows. Cheapest protein sold in the markets of Jesus' time. I tell you, not one of these little sparrows falls that my Father knows and cares. 
They sang in the series I preached this week. One of the Methodist preachers, the one who pastors the church where I grew up now, has a beautiful voice and he sang, his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. That's the affirmation here. So the ability to go out beyond ourselves, to be anxious. Remember when they did frontal lobotomies some years ago? Doctors finally got to the point they could give just a local anesthetic and run a little instrument sort of like a knitting needle right up past your eye and sever the frontal lobe of your brain. It kept people from being anxious. It also kept them from being people. They just sort of vegetated after that. They just walked around like zombies. They discovered that that wasn't the right way to go. The ability to look outside oneself, to project oneself into the future, tends to make us anxious. And only by trusting uh, that God's going to be there in the next moment as God was in the past and is now present in this one, uh, helps us to trust. Trust. Don't rush too far ahead. Don't rush too far ahead, Jesus said. Deal with the day the best you can. Deal with the day. And tomorrow we'll have sufficient problems for tomorrow. Don't rush ahead to those, he's saying. All right. Um, in the Hebrew text that this author seems to have in mind, we hear, ears you have dug for me, literally, or our translation in, of that ancient passage in Psalm says, you have given me an open ear, unable to hear what's being said to me by God, through God's messenger. The image is of one who's prepared to listen and having heard to obey. So, this writer of Hebrews chapter 10 uses a variant reading of that Psalm 40, verse 6, that replaces ear, otion, we still use that ear, nose, throat, uh, uh, ancient uh, Greek word, ear with body, which is the Greek word soma. This alternate reading fits perfectly the argument that he's now bringing to a close. That is, not through the repeated rituals of the old Torah system of sacrifice, But through the offering of the body of Jesus, once for all, we have been set apart, sanctified, set apart, not for special favor, but for service of the one true God and all the other children of God. This sanctification is another way of saying what is expressed elsewhere as the cleansing and gradual perfecting of the conscience. Without directly saying so, Craddock believes, this writer is commenting on the inwardness of the new covenant. That is, on the mind, on the heart, bringing mercy and forgiveness. But the word body stands firm to prevent a totally subjective reading of Christ's redemptive work. He really was a person, a real flesh and blood person. So just as Jeremiah had seen a new covenant replacing the old, So the psalmist saw the end of the old sacrificial system and the inauguration of the new. The Christian contribution to the thought here is in the hearing in Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8, the voice of Christ himself as the one through whom the old ends and the new begins. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me, he's quoted as saying, and that scroll of the book happens to be Psalm 40. For the psalmist, two possible meanings suggest themselves. That ancient poet, what did he have in mind? The line could refer to the common notion of God's making entries in a book about each of us, what we are to do and what we actually get done. For the Christian reader, the statement may be taken as a general reference to all that was written in the Hebrew scriptures that we find now pointing the way to our Lord Jesus. Okay, let's read a little farther. Verse 11. Every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. When he's writing, that's true. Sacrifices are still being offered every day on the temple, temple mount. That would end in the year 70. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified, set apart. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my Torah in their hearts. I will write them on their minds. 
he also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. And what this author is saying, what Dr. Craddock is helping him say is, if you confess the same sin to God more than once, you didn't really believe in forgiveness. If you confess the same sin more than once, you didn't really believe in forgiveness. We had a woman in this church some years ago who ended up in the hospital any number of times on the psychiatric floor when St. John still had a floor designated psychiatric. And one time I asked Art McGrew, he was still on staff, he and I were making all the hospital calls, Art, what do you think her problem is? And he said, she did something 40 years ago that she has never forgiven herself. Never. And if you haven't forgiven yourself, it means you didn't really believe God did forgive you. See? If you confess your sins and you're willing for God to turn you, Hebrew idea, turn you and send you in a better direction, you never need to confess that sin again. He really did forgive you. Really did forgive you. Notice the contrast between other priests and Jesus Christ. They stand because their work never ends. It's a day after day tedium of ineffectiveness, this author feels. But Christ sits because the single offering once for all has been completed. The one benefit of Christ's priestly work specified is the perfection of the ones being sanctified. It's present tense indicating in the process God is moving us on toward this better behavior. This What the Wesleys talked about is coming to perfection in this life. Not of act. We will make mistakes, all of us, till the day we die. But that our will can be perfected in this lifetime by the grace of God. Not just trying harder, but surrendering more and more to the grace of God. God can help us want to do the right thing every time. He can bring us to that point that we want to do the right thing every time. Okay, let me give you just a few more sentences from Craddock here. So the new covenant, this author says, is now in place. Its benefits are ours. This is the final word. The very last word is no more. No more remembrance of sin. No longer any need for the continuation of these acts of sacrifice that by their very reputation testified to their ineffectiveness. If you've got to do them over and over and over and over, then they're not working. But perhaps most critical for fruitful engagements with this material will be introducing participants, those of you and I who are hearing it again, to a world of ritual. For many of us, a strange new world. There is a tent or tabernacle that is a tent of meeting, a place for meeting, not other persons for fellowship and conviviality, but a place where we can meet God. In the tabernacle are pieces of furniture, each with historical and theological significance. On the appointed day of atonement, Yom Kippur, the high priest enters alone beyond the chamber where other priests serve into the most holy place to minister before the very mercy seat of God. The place of meeting between God and persons who wait anxiously outside for the return of the high priest who has approached God on their behalf and will come back and say, by God's grace and mercy, you have been forgiven. And that's what we do at communion every time. Do we not? Every time. The new liturgies say, Your sins are forgiven and you respond to the celebrant and your sins also are forgiven. Neither the blood of calves and goats nor the countless other offerings of the priests could ever take away sin. The ultimate benefit for us is that we can be forgiven and granted access to Almighty God. Two reminders about inwardness are in order, Craddock says. First, the interior 
of our faith has its origin and prompting in the work of Christ's own ministry. The sacrifice of His will is offering up His will to the will of God. Second, the whole redemptive work of Christ cannot be written without remainder on the human mind or heart or conscience. Out there, historically and objectively, the person of Jesus, who lived among us as one like us, the cross on which was offered the body of that Jesus, the community with whom and among whom the benefits of Christ's ministry are shared, and the world created and upheld by his word of power. Blood, in ancient texts, were the equivalent for life or life force. Ancients, though they didn't know about a circulatory system, they understood that if any animal, including human ones, blood runs out, we die. So modern readers may find this expression more palatable, if you would, than shedding blood. So Christ's offering of his life to God was the ultimate act of worship in order that we, with purified consciences, may worship the living God. The word of Hebrews, then, is not unlike the urging of Paul when he wrote to the Romans. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So, two images are offered. One is of a priest standing, working in the relentless cycle of day after day, repetition of same words and actions. It's a picture of futility as painted by this author. The other image is of a priest who's made a single offering, a one-time only offering, and is now seated waiting for the full harvest of benefits from that never-to-be-repeated sacrifice. It is the picture of the end. Okay? All right, we're going to stop there. We'll mark chapter 10, verse 19. All right? If you haven't been to church, don't rush off.